usually the phone call you make after a proposal is like, hey, we're, we're engaged now. Well, we didn't have cell signals, so we couldn't call, but our next phone call was, hey, we were in a plane crash. You see uh, souls and fuel remaining. I don't know how much fuel I got, but I bet I got at least one or two quarts. Air traffic control. Mayday, mayday, mayday. So you had two choices to give up or fight for your life. Told him I loved him, and I put the nose of the plane down into the canyon. In, in the face of any stress or worry, John is just, what's next? Here's the next step. So with flying, I mean, everything was methodical for him. Everything was, all right, this is first, this is next. I check this, I check that. We're good to go. You ready? And here we go. Um, so I had, you know, complete confidence all the time that, because John was confident, you know, and um, there wasn't anything I ever felt like that we would get into that we couldn't get out of. still go out there and see the fuel-soaked hay bales. How those didn't go up that day with all of us stuck inside of that airplane, I'll never understand that. It was a Friday. I was working in Searcy at the time. We actually lived in Newport, Arkansas. It was probably 4.35 when I left Searcy. I told her, meet me at the airport in Newport and I'll pick you up. I remember thinking, this is a lot of stuff in my car, <laughs> you know? Like, this is a lot for a car. Um, and I'm like, you think we're gonna be able to take it all? Like, do we need to leave some things? Like, are we even be able to gonna get the cooler in here? And he's like, no, I can make it work. We can make this work, it'll fit, you know? And it was like Tetris in there, but it fit. I was used to the 210, whatever I can put in it, I'll go and it'll take off. But 170, it's, you gotta, you gotta know what it can carry. I remember us planning it for a while just because of weight alone. Like that was, that was something that we had really considered in the beginning and it really still ended up being an issue. Before I left Newport to check the weather at Ozark, there wasn't any chances of rain or uh, any weather or anything. So you know, I always make an alternate, even VFR. So alternate was Ozark or Clarksville um, if I couldn't get into birds. We had just gotten the airplane back from the interior shop and it was actually at the interior shop for about nine months. So there was a little nine months there that I didn't fly it, didn't have any tailwheel time. That was one of the contributing factors of just proficiency. So at Cersei, I did about five short takeoffs. And then when I got to Newport, I did about one or two there. On paved, if I'm off at or before the thousand foot markers, maybe give myself another 500 feet. So that's 1,500 feet. I know birds is 1,900 feet with another extra overrun. So I felt, I felt comfortable at the time. We loaded up and headed out from Newport. I'm like, you know what? We got off the ground here, so we're good for the weekend. You know, I honestly thought like if anything happens, like it can't be that bad. Like John would be able to fix it or figure it out. Like he's always been the figure outer, you know? Um, so I'm just like along for the ride at this point. Got to birds, did a flyby, just making sure everything looked good on the strip. Landed and uh, set up camp. John was a boy scout and, you know, he was really good about setting up camp and just taking orders, you know, from Scoutmaster John. We go to get ready for dinner and we're cooking dinner that night. And um, I'm like prepping some veggies or something like cutting something up and John uh, says, hey, babe. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, hey. <laughs> he's like, uh, turn around. And he's down on one knee. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> You're lying. Uh, nuh -uh. uh. I couldn't believe it, really. Of course, I said yes. It was just surreal. I remember, like, John building a campfire after that. And just like, this is the best campfire ever. This is the first campfire of us in our rest of our life. We wake up the next morning, have breakfast, and then we're thinking like, okay, do we want to tell everyone now? Because there's no Wi-Fi, there's no service here. So we have to go up to the restaurant. And we're like, do we want to tell people now? Like, do we want this to be a surprise when we go home? Do we want to tell people in person? Or do we want to just like call and tell everyone now? And so we decided not to tell a soul until we got back. And, um, that was kind of our push to get going, like to get out of this place, like, all right, let's go. 
Let's go pack up our stuff and get going. So we decided to leave right after lunch. Got, got all packed up in the airplane, made sure everything was good, did my pre-flight, walked around the airplane, everything was good. Did a little prepping before coming here. Um, I looked at the owner's manual, seeing what they recommended for short takeoffs. I normally take off 10 degrees flaps, but Brooke said 20 degrees flaps. I'm like, oh, okay. The POH for John's aircraft does recommend 20 degrees of flaps, if desired on takeoff. But there's a caveat on page 27 that states, as altitudes and outside air temperatures increase, drag offsets lift until eventually the use of flaps increase the takeoff distance. The POH then recommends using the chart on page 37 to calculate your takeoff performance. So I actually did a couple of 20 degree flap takeoffs back home and uh, that was a, actually worked pretty good. I noticed it was a little warm that, that afternoon after when we were getting ready to leave, but I still wasn't thinking about density altitude or anything at that time. Just ready to get home, get back. I figure to the 1900 feet runway with another 600 to 1000 feet be good enough to get up, get up over the trees. You hear them kind of do a run up and taxi over and get to the end of the runway and uh, we're still just kind of having our conversation. We hear them, you know, kind of go full power, go take off power and uh, we, we all stand and um, and kind of stop and see what we're doing and just kind of watch, right? Uh, it's natural reaction for pilots, right? We all kind of stand around and look at other pilots take off. And so he, he goes full power and we all kind of turn. We can't see him at the end of the runway at this point from where we're at, but we can hear him. I was looking at the runway. I'm like, this looks shorter than what I remember. <laughs> I'm like, well, let's go for it. So put the 20 degrees flaps in and push the power forward and slowly crawled away. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, you could tell it was struggling. But I was used to the performance of our 210, it's a 260 horsepower engine. So I had a, went back to 145 horsepower, so that's, you don't realize how much of a difference that makes. I got the tail up about a quarter way down the runway. I had an abort point probably three quarters of the run down on the runway, and I was about to abort, and then I think it hit a, hit a hump and lifted up and stayed up. So I'm like, well, let's, let's keep on going. By the time he gets into our line of sight, we notice that he's off the ground, but he's really low. Like maybe in ground effect, but certainly not above treetop height, but he's run out of runway quick. I was in ground effect until I got to the 67, 70, and then climbed out. As soon as I pitched up a little bit, airspeed went back down to about 67, 65. And I uh, was in there for a little bit, looked at my vertical speed, it was, zero to 100 feet. It was not what I wanted. <laughs> and um, about that time, like, wasn't thinking again. I uh, lowered the one notch of flaps to see if I could increase my speed. I shouldn't have done that because <laughs> the airplane sunk. I noticed the trees were getting closer. That's when things started moving faster. The hangar we're standing at is right in front of two short, very short crosswind runways that are really designed for competition. Um, certainly not for a 170 fully loaded. But John turns as if he's going to try and, and come back to one of these, these two crosswind runways. I knew what was going through his mind. I've taken off out of that runway. It feels like the right decision, if you couldn't make the trees, would be to take a left turn. Um, and so as soon as I saw the left wing start to dip, I knew exactly what was going through John's head, which was, I'm not going to make the rising terrain. I'm going to turn to these crosswind runways. Um, in a much lighter, much more powerful airplane, he would have made, made that left-hand turn. It would have landed at a crosswind runway, um, but not in the 170. I thought I had enough airspeed to keep me going in the turn. And the turn, we started sinking, and uh, that's when it got heavy in my chest. And then I heard the stall horn go off. I just hear him yell out, I'm sorry, babe. And then I remember like holding on to um, bracing myself, you know, you're not supposed to brace yourself. And I, I did, and I remember grabbing for him too. And just this peaceful moment of, I just really thought our engagement would last longer than that. I just, okay, we're finally engaged in life. I just thought this would last longer. But also this thought of, <laughs> I 
just if we were gonna die, we're together, you know? But at least we're both going. I just, I just knew that's what was happening. So. And it was peaceful, oh. And then, um, crash. In total honesty, when they hit, we were, you know, they hit as we were running. Um, and I don't think any of us expected to find anyone alive in the airplane. Like it, it hit so hard and made such a sound of, it was just like, there's no way. Um, we half expected it to kind of walk up to it and it'd be on fire. Um, we get up to the airplane and uh, there's, there's screaming coming from the airplane. And like, I think all three of us were both like, we all stood there a little bit in shock for a second of like, didn't expect that. Uh, it was a little bit of like a relief of like, oh my God, they're alive. But then instantly like, how do we get them out of here? Um, the airplane had landed in a, in a tree line managed to somehow miss every tree in this tree line um, and then nosed in in a, in a stack of hay bales. We get up there and start pulling, trying to get doors ripped off. Um, and the first thing we have to do is just start removing all the camping gear. Um, you know, as they nosed in, all the camping gear that was packed in behind them, you know, came down on top of them. Um, and so not only were they, you know, trapped down in there within the panel, but then all the camping gear they had carried was now on top of them. My watch woke us up. Or like we were out of it, you know, for, I don't know, it could have been 10 minutes, it could have been 10 seconds. And um, I had my Apple Watch on and it had detected either a fall or a crash or something and I tried calling 911. And I just remember it being the loudest sound that I've ever heard from my watch, you know. I'd never heard it so loud or buzz so hard. And I just remember it being like annoying. I'm like, what's going on? And then I'm like, we just crashed. Then I remember looking down and seeing the fuel line was cut and the engine is steaming and uh, thinking, I'm like, well, that didn't kill us, but this is about to. Mackenzie was, was doing a lot better than John was at the time. And so we were able to have her help and we were able to get her out of the airplane. All this time, there's uh, av gas is just pouring through the windshield onto John, onto all of us that are now in the front trying to help him get out. Um, I remember looking over at, at Jared and, and Luke and, and we both kind of, all three of us had kind of made eye contact looking at the jet or looking at the, the av gas pouring out of the airplane. We all kind of had this like, hey, if like, if it starts to go, we have to leave John. Um, but we all were like, we're not leaving John until that situation arises. Last time I was here was when we crashed. It brought back some memories, hard ones. There were nights I couldn't fall asleep. Just, I'd close my eyes and I'd just relive everything over and over and over. And I just didn't want to sleep because, or try to fall asleep because that's what would happen. And I saw John sleeping one time and him like pulling back the controls in his sleep, having his, these shaking dreams. And I'm like, this is gonna be a long road of just like mental recovery, not only physical, but like this is shaking us up. Yeah, I think just like from a trauma standpoint, right? Like I had dreams after that event, you know, of like waking up or, you know, being asleep and um, you would just be, I'd be back in that cockpit with fuel, you know, pouring over me um, and, you know, having, looking down at John and just, you know, his, the amount of tissue hanging out of his leg that day was, I mean, something I'd never seen in my life. I've been around a lot of traumatic situations and like, it was just such an intimate moment with him in there. When John had his first nightmare, you know, I knew in my head, I'm like, we've got to take care of this. And then watching him have one every day that first week, I just sat down with him. I'm like, we've, what's your thoughts on us both going to therapy? I know I have to. But what's your thoughts on both of us talking with a professional through this that can help us handle this? And he instantly agreed. He's like, yeah, no, there's, I've got to 
take care of this too. I've owned up to my mistake. I mean, it's truly pilot error in this instance as far as not being fully prepared, understanding density, altitude, performance of the airplane, proficiency in the airplane that you're flying. A lot of takeaways that I've owned up to and tried to make sure other pilots understand what happened in my situation. In the aftermath of this event, I think one of the ways that I personally have been able to help kind of combat this and deal with the, the trauma was looking at how can I make a difference in helping to make sure this doesn't happen again, both at birds, but also in other places. You know, one of the big challenges we have is just like t talking to 911. We couldn't get out, we couldn't call 911. And so we've covered all of the runways with Wi-Fi and the ability for you to, you know, anyone that witnesses something on the property or you yourself getting yourself into a bad situation, you will be able to call or text 911. The other big thing is his accident probably could have been very easily avoided with two things. One, either taking off earlier in the day, taking off later in the day, because of density altitude. And if he had known what the density altitude was when he took off, I guarantee you he wouldn't have taken off. He wouldn't have ran up the engine. He would have sat there on the ramp. They'd have seen the sign that said uh, DA, and they wouldn't have gone. Um, so that's the other piece of, you know, to help me <laughs> pass this trauma is we've started working on building our own weather station that we can install at backcountry airstrips. And part of that weather station is it has a big LED readout screen that people can hang wherever it's convenient on the property that pilots are going to be able to see it before they hit go. I'm sure I'll get a lot of flack from other people that judge and stuff, but if, if, I, if I can just help one or two people, that's, that's worth it in my opinion.